Hello there, welcome back. So, where are we now? This is uh, this is the next day, and we've got our parts now, which have all been washed and rinsed and dried and everything. So now we know they're pretty good for paint. You'll still see some residue on them, perhaps. Um, that, that could be actually in the plastic. Uh, but basically, you know you've got 99% of the grease off. So um, that's what you're looking for, is basically just making sure. It's just a bit of reassurance, especially with uh, modern paints today, acrylic paints. They don't stick well to plastic at all at the best of times. So it's best to um, give the parts a wash. Um, painting is another whole subject which we will cover and I will cover with you um, moving forward. So what I want to do now is just quickly look at the instructions. And <clears throat> being that this is an old Airfix kit, um, it, it's going to cause you a little bit of a problem to start with, um, but it's it's not insurmountable and it's something you will get used to and it's no problem at all. Happens really with the older kits, the older uh, Airfix and Revell kits, but the more modern kits don't seem to have this issue. But as you can see, you've got all your suspension components here. You've got all your front suspension, which is fairly complex, especially for a beginner, but we'll go through that, we'll cover it. Got the rear suspension here, which is fairly simple, an engine and gearbox. Now, as I said, with modern kits, you get a sprue call out, which will basically give you an image of what all these parts look like. So you basically get a drawing like this. Now, I want to show you this. This is a, um, a more modern kit. In fact, this has only come out this year, I believe, or maybe last year. But this is a, um, a 135th scale German tank, Jagdpanzer. It's actually a tank destroyer. And I'll be building this on Christmas Day if you want to come and have a look. I'll be putting a video up every couple of hours as I go through and um, hopefully getting this thing built and maybe painted as well on Christmas Day. But as we open the front, what we can see here is this sprue call out that I'm talking about that you get with more modern kits. And you'll also notice straight away the difference here. If you look at these sprues, they're kind of like trees with all bits just hanging off them. More modern kits tend to have an actual frame with the parts within them and what you're getting here is an actual identification of what those parts are in that sprue so you've got all the numbers here showing you all the parts so you can see if you've got some damage or something's missing or something's not quite right and the other thing you'll find is like here you've got all the wheels and all the suspension components are on these two sprues so when you come to here as you can see they're calling out C28 that means spruce C spruce C part number 28 C11 and C23 C10 and C22 you know so everything comes from the same sprue so you're sort of always working off of this one sprue and what you'll find is as you get this part of the kit done you'll probably find that sprue can go in the bin because you finish with it and then you walk you go through you know all these parts here are a got more a parts here this is all a here so Basically, that's the way they do things on modern kits. Now, old Airfix kits, as you see already, we, we've got these old sprues, and the parts tend to be dotted all over the place. Now, you can see here, part number 14, the rear axle, there it is, part number 14. You can see the 14 there, and that's the rear axle. And then we've got the parts here, 10 and 11, and that part there, number 5, is it? 6. Part number 6 is there on this sprue then we go to this sprue and there's nothing oh yes we've got the gearbox there on this sprue and then on this sprue we've got some suspension components there nothing on that one um <clears throat> what have we got on this one nothing that i can see immediately And then on this one, we've got our front leaf spring here, which is part number one, which is there. We've got our two rear springs there. So you can see that the parts are basically dotted all over the place and you've got to go and find them. Um, and on the bigger, more complex kits with many, many more sprues, something like a 124 scale Spitfire, you'll find you'll spend most of your time hunting parts down rather than actually uh, making the model. So what we need to do, we can do two things here. If we concentrate on this section here initially, we can get all the parts off the sprue and then put it all together. Or we can get one part off the sprue 
and the next part put them together then get another part off so what I'll do you can do it either way it doesn't really matter how you go but you need to be careful if you're going to get all the parts off the sprue these parts here like 10 and 11 obviously one is a lot shorter than the other one so that's okay but if you look at five part number five and part number eight yeah they're the actual spindles that the wheels go on there's only a very slight difference to them so you might want to sort of consider just get the parts off for this side and then get the parts off for that side if you get it all off you're asking for trouble so let's start by just looking at this rear suspension because we can't go wrong there really so let's get the parts off the sprue and just before we do carry on there's one thing I forgot to cover in the actual um, tools part was the uh, cutting mat now you can get these sort of cutting mats like I've got here from places like Hobbycraft and they're quite expensive but they are very very good um, <clears throat> and when you're using your knives and your paint and everything you will mark them you will spill stuff on them so if you can find something cheaper to protect them then do that and these this is like an A3 size cutting mat you can see this size this side has been well used it's very dirty um, but you can find these in places like Aldi or Lidl um, I think they're about 2 dollars and they're not as good quality as these cutting mats as the green ones but they're absolutely perfect for doing this sort of stuff and once it is ruined and cut about and hacked about and you've, I mean, you can see I've spilled glue on it here I've got paint on it here you can see on this side it's got it's got really grubby and I've stuck tape to it for you can see bits of super glue here once it's actually used and abused you chuck it away and under here I've got another one this is what the latest ones I think got a yellow one there look so you know basically um, go and get yourself a cutting mat it saves you destroying the uh, the table or whatever it is you're working and um, if you are a youngster and you're doing it in the kitchen then you know you don't want to be uh, getting your mum's back up so um yeah so get yourself a cutting mat they're about two or three pound and um and go from there you can also get them a4 half this size so uh yeah get yourself a cutting mat you won't go wrong what we'll do is we'll start with part number one and part number two so you can see here this leaf spring part number one is going to be attached to the chassis which is part number two don't be confused by the 30 that's the paint color remember these numbers without the circle around them are paint colors so we're going to attach part number one to part number two and it's also worth noting here that when you're doing this sort of thing look at the next step because it often shows you how the parts go together so we can see here that leaf spring is going to go on there and all the suspension parts here will go under the leaf spring they're above the leaf spring but as it's upside down they're going to be underneath the leaf spring so we're going to remove part number one which is on the sprue here and we can see that we've got there part number one now <clears throat> if you remember we talked about tools and I said about how difficult it would be to remove these just by twisting them off so there's two ways you can do this you can use the cutters as I mentioned or the cheaper cutters or you can use a knife I would seriously recommend using cutters the problem with using a knife is when you press down you run the risk of damaging other parts on the sprue and also you run the risk of damaging <clears throat> that part because you're going to basically press it off the sprue rather than cutting it so <clears throat> if I show you both methods you can see here when I use a knife I'm pushing down on it and then I cut through and you can see as it goes through it pushes it over whereas if I use my cutters and I say these are the cheap cutters I can just go in there and cut like that as you can see and what you need to do is lay off don't go too close to the part with the cutters because you run the risk of damaging it and as you can see with these cutters they're a little more cumbersome so if you can stretch to the extra money for these little Tamiya cutters they will if, you, if, if you're in the hobby for a few years these will last you a few years if you look after them and you can get right in there really close and nip that off and you can see that now that is ready to just fall off like that so that's that part removed now what we got here you've got bits of sprue left on there 
and those bits of sprue are called nubs or nibs or whatever and what you can do now you can go around with your cutters and you can take the worst of them off like so yeah that's that and you can see that where I used a knife I've actually removed some of the plastic there so now we've got that like that we need to clean up with a knife and always try and cut away from yourself you'll find me or you'll see me doing this all the time it's because I'm experienced it's because I've been doing it for well nearly 50 years now and I tend to um, do stuff like this here again we can use these cutters and I tend to do stuff which is probably not the the best way to do it but always try and cut away from yourself and remember a blunt knife is a dangerous knife you always need a nice sharp blade so there we go I'm just cutting away from myself just to remove those those nibs like that and now I can get my sanding stick now I'm going to use one of these small ones you can use any of the in fact what I'll do is I'll use one of these which is the ones you can get from Tesco's so I'm just basically going to go over and sand away and remove the excess of those sprue nubs where they were and also if you notice you get down the part in the middle you'll get a seam line you can probably see there if you look close up you'll see a, a line down the middle a mold line and <clears throat> you can either with your knife scrape that away you don't have to do this you may choose not to do it but it's um it does add, add to the overall realism of the model especially on like large exposed areas and you can see here what I'm doing I've got that little sprue nub and I'm just going around with the sanding stick there you are getting the round shape back and the same on that side and there we go so that's that part cleaned up pretty much ready to go right so that's that part one now we need part number two which is this one and this is where we start need to start being careful about how we remove stuff now you can see there's just two parts on here so I don't want this piece lying around in the box so I'm going to cut that off there and then that roof panel can go back in the box. Now if I just go and hack this off or try and snap it off I'm likely to take part of the floor off with it. So what I need to do is laying off the sprue, laying off the part, cut that, get rid of that sprue. Now I can go in a bit closer and cut. I'm going to go upside down on this one and cut and there we can see I've removed that. Now if I want to I can go in even closer still, cut. Now I hope you're beginning to see just how good these tools are. And bearing in mind these are just the cheap ones you get in Hobbycraft or on, um, on Amazon or whatever. And now we can use the knife. Again I'm cutting into myself but I'll try and cut away for you guys and just remove the excess like so you can see I've still got some on there that's fine and this is where these hard sanding sticks from Tesco's come in really handy if I go in here with a soft sponge I'll start to put a radius on it and stuff but these hard these hard sticks I can go up to the surface sand away and you can see that is completely gone I don't hope you can see what I'm doing it's completely gone and flat Now let's look around the rest of the part before we carry on. I've actually cleaned these edges up before I washed it but um, just checking the edges have got no flash. Flash is where you'll get a piece of plastic sticking off where the mould comes together you'll get a join and you might get some flash sticking out. Now we've got what are called ejector pin marks under here. When the parts are made they're made in a mould like this and the two halves of the mould come together. Plastic is injected fills up the cavities and then the mold comes apart well as you can imagine the parts don't want to come out of the mold so basically they design the, 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 the sprue so that as the tool opens the part will stay in this side in this example so mold tool comes together plastics injected that's it mold tool comes apart the, the sprue stays in this side 
and then they have rods inside the tool that push the part out and the part will then fall out and then the mold tool comes back together and it all starts again. Well, where you get those rods pushing out, you'll get these and these are called ejector pin marks. And you'll get this type here, which is a, basically a circle on the part. And you'll get this type here, which is actually a circle on the sprue. And then you'll also get this type here, which is like a little lump on the part that's aided it coming out of the mold tool. Now that you need to identify is that is that actually an ejector pin stub or is it part of the actual part on many Tamiya kits which are great for beginners you will find that 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 nub is actually shown on the instructions they'll show you to remove that whereas with the the cheaper airfix kits like this they don't you just have to use your own judgment but if you look generally what you can see is this part here hasn't got it so that part there you know it needs to be removed so these are ejector pin marks. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll get them like this, which are fairly flush. Sometimes you'll get them like this one in here, if you can catch it in the light. That one in there is, is sunken under the surface. And then you'll also get this type here where you've got, it's sunken into the surface, but there's a big lump of plastic sticking out the side of it. Now we want to remove that because it doesn't look very good. And quite often, not in this case, but quite often you'll find that that actual piece of, of uh, ejector pin will get in the way. So once again, as I say, these very, very handy tools, you just come along in there and cut that off. And that's gone. And then using our knife, in fact, this time I'm going to use this knife with the curved blade. I can go in and I can just gently scrape that until it's gone. And you can see there it's all gone now this is all down to how fussy you want to be this is obviously underneath the car you can remove all these you could fill them whatever all I'm gonna do for this video is just show you how to remove them roughly so you can scrape them like this until they disappear okay you can cut them Like that and then scrape them until they disappear and this is where having the right tools is good because like I showed you if you had one of these knives like this okay it's great it's a good little tool it's cheap it's readily available but getting in places like that, or especially in places like it's, they're, they're quite difficult to use. And also you can see that the blade is bending all over the place when I try and scrape with it. So having the right tools for the job makes life a lot easier and will always, always give you better results. So there we go, I'm scraping those away. And the other way to get rid of them, so I go down in here, I can scrape those big ones away. Again, using the round blade if you try and use a straight blade in areas like this you can obviously you can't you can see you can't get on it because the blade is, is straight so you need to get a curved blade in there so you can get on it I'm just scraping away like this you may decide to just leave these because they don't matter they're underneath the wheel arches but you will find you'll get to places where you want to remove them because they look awful you'll get one say right in the middle of the driver's seat or there are even some kits out there believe it or not <clears throat> they put like on aircraft they've put an ejector pin in the middle of the canopy so when you look at the clear glass through to, you, to see your cockpit you will actually see one of these ejector pin marks so just scraping these away in fact I'm going to cut this one And as I said, remember a blunt blade is a dangerous blade. A sharp, you won't cut yourself with a sharper blade, believe it or not. Well, you won't often cut yourself with a sharper blade. Now, the other way to do this is to sand it. Now, with these here, I can get to this simple enough with this, with this Tesco sanding stick. I can get on there and I can sand that away. 
until it disappears. And there we go. Just like that. Yeah, so that's all but gone. But you can see I can't use this down in there. So you've got options. You can cut these. You can use a knife, cut them into a thinner strip and then use it. In fact, I'll show you that now. I've got one here which I've already cut. Here we go. You can see I've already cut this one to use a thinner strip. And what you can do is get a rule. <clears throat> Hold your rule. It's going to ruin your blade, so don't use a brand new blade for it. And basically these are like a very thin wood they're made of. And you can just keep going through. And there we go, we're through now. And now I can cut the top there and then just snap it off. You can see it's like a thin wood with uh, with a paper glue to it. And there we go, I can do that there. So now I've made a thin stick and I can get in here and sand that one down, for example. Yeah. Or if you go on to flory.co.uk or florymodels.co.uk you'll find he does these sanding sticks remember I showed you yesterday in the video all the the various sticks you can buy he does a pack of all your, your most common ones so if you get that I think it's about 10 pounds and it's a pack of assorted sanding sticks and the beauty of these is you'll find you generally use just the ends you, you won't find you use the middle very much so what you can do then when the ends worn out take your cutters Cut the end off. Now you've got a brand new stick. Yeah, and you can see they're absolutely wonderful for getting in. And again with these, if you want to get into really tight places, go with your cutters, cut that out. And now you've got one that goes really thin for really thin little places, as you can see. So these things are great to have. They're not cheap, but as I said, you know, your, your work is always going to be a reflection of the uh, of the tools you use. And I'm not saying that having the, the right tools is going to make you a perfection perfectionist or a, a class one modeler. I'm certainly not. Um, but having the right tools will make your life a lot easier and it will enable you to get the right results. You can see again with these as well, you they, they will bend slightly and I'm able to get in there and remove these ejector pin marks. Again, we've got one on the front there, so I can remove that one like that. Okay, so if you're still awake, well done. Um, you may decide you don't want to do this. I'm going to switch the camera off now, go on and get rid of the rest of these ejector pin marks because I want to get rid of them, and then I'll come back to you and we'll show you how we stick it all together. I've got the parts cleaned up now, so you can see I've removed all the ejector pin marks. I haven't worried about that one because it's underneath the engine. So we've got our leaf spring here all cleaned up. We've got our chassis here cleaned up. So part number one, part number two, we're going to glue them together. I'm going to show you how you do this with this um, contactor cement from Ravel. This is the one, they call it Contactor Professional Mini. Um, this is the one with the little metal probe on the front. It's... <laughs> It's not difficult to use and I'll show you now the biggest problem with this is it keeps blocking up and you need a piece of very fine wire because you've got that tiny little nozzle on there that keeps blocking up and it can be a pain. Um, so, you know, maybe think twice about getting this one or make sure you've got a piece of fine sort of 0.2 millimeter wire or a thin pin. You know, it is a tiny hole. A normal needle won't go in there. Um, so yeah, get yourself a little piece of wire or something for unblocking it. And the other thing is you can pull it out to clear it out and then push it back in after. Okay, so I'll use that glue just to show you how it's used. Now straight away, something I've noticed on, this may not be a fantastic kit to show a beginner how to get going, but you know, I'm sure we'll get there in the end. If it gets too difficult, I'll go and get something simpler and just use a different model to show you. But everything else we've learned up to now will remain the same. So part number one, part number two, and if we look at this leaf spring, we can see that it's not the same front and back. You can see that the, the actual 
spring this eyelet on the end is offset to one side I just need to round that off a bit as well don't I? I didn't quite finish peeling that up so that's off to one side so we need to look on the instructions to see which way it goes and it's not very clear at all now if we look at the next part you can see there it's showing you that the actual front of the leaf spring is flat so that means the cutouts go to the rear if this was a Tamiya kit or a later kit they would probably have put a peg on there like a t-shaped peg to go into a t-shaped hole so you couldn't get it the wrong way round. but um, unfortunately on this kit so the other thing you must remember with modeling never go straight to glue always test fit first so I'm just gonna see if that fits in there and it does if it's in the hole and it stays there so what I'm gonna do is using this glue I'm just gonna put a tiny drop of glue you'll see how much I use tiny drop of glue on there like that and that's plenty there and I'm going to glue the spring in just push it into place and there it is that's in okay so that's that in there now so that's part number one glued in so part number one the next one we need is part number three and part number four because they're going to go together and then go in and we can see that it's not very clear on those instructions so we look and we can see here there's the part underneath there and there's the part on top so there's three underneath and four on top three four three four so let's go and find those on the sprues and here's number three as we can see there so we'll clip that one off I'll use my little Tamiya cutters on this one so there's part number three cut off and then we also want part number four which you would think would be next to it but it's not <laughs> so we have to go around and dig around and find it and here it is we've got part number four there so again I'm going to cut this one off so put those down there and then once again as before we do the cleanup now the other thing we need to look at is we cut this off the sprue and we're left with this round part here does that need to stay does it matter does it need to go and looking at the way it goes it doesn't matter because it's sitting on the bottom so you can sand it off or you can leave it but um just leave it there you may as well so give that a quick clean up with a sanding stick remove the seam line because in this situation now that seam line there that's the face that's going to be gluing onto the model so we really want that out of the way moving our sprue nib there you can see because I've left hardly anything on there I don't need to worry about cleaning it up with a knife first and all I'm doing here is removing this mold seam around here now again these flory sanders this is with the blue soft one and absolutely wonderful for round parts because as you can see I'm not trying to sell flory's products I'm just promoting them because they are very good but you can see here that I'm going to use this and you can see that as I sand it the sanding stick forms a round shape around the part so the sanding stick will actually remove the seam and leave a round I must excuse my disgusting fingernails I'm afraid I bite my nails I have done since I was six years old so uh, I'm sorry about that but I can't do this with gloves on so there we go you can use these soft sponge sanding sticks remember I said the soft sponge will give you a rounded edge these hard ones like the ones you get from Tesco's will always give you a flat edge so like for doing the edge of the floor on here perfect for doing these small round parts the rest the foam one is perfect so again like you can see on here I'll go like that and you can see it follows the round contours of the part I dropped it I am beginning to think as I'm doing this this is not a good model to show beginners how to get going I think I might get a Tamiya kit out and swap it over so anyway now we know that that part there 
needs to glue into there and this part here goes on the top of it so it looks like this goes over that there yeah so that's going to go in like that I'll get some tweezers so you can see what I'm doing so this part here goes in like that And it's actually, I can push that together and it stays there. It wedges into place. So you can see, there you go. So there's those two parts together. Now, if you remember, I said about this cement being the ultimate. I'll show you now where everybody uses it. Let's put the cover back on this one. The beauty of this cement, it's very thin. It's like water. And what you can do with this, you can see you open the bottle. It's got a very, very fine brush. What you do is you dip it in the glue, wipe it on the side, and then here you can literally just touch there. It'll drop more glue and touch there. And that's it, that's glued. Um, and that is the beauty of this, this cement. You could put the parts together first and then add the glue after, which is, uh, which is nice. So now those are done and we need to fit these onto the actual chassis itself. So that's the front suspension now together as you can see. Um, that's just uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and eight on there. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on there. And there's the parts on there. And you'll also notice what I've done, I've given the wheels a bit of a steer to the, what's that, to the right. Yeah, a bit of a turn to the right. Most model kits these days don't allow you to do steering. They just, some even have metal axles and you just got the wheels straight ahead. Um, it always looks a bit false. You very rarely see a vehicle parked up with the wheels straight ahead. So if you can, it's always good to give the wheels a bit of a bit of an angle just to make the model look a bit more realistic. Um, unless of course you've got awful wheels with terrible tread so uh, and then you don't want to um, you don't want to flash to show your tires off so um, but anyway yeah this is just a slight turn slight turn to the right adds a bit of realism the other thing you need to be careful of here is as I say this kit is is is, is probably not an ideal beginners kit but we'll, we'll carry on anyway um, we need to make sure that the the spindles here that the wheels sit on are level with the chassis now what we don't want to do is end up with a model that sits on three wheels so after it's all built and everything's set there will be some, you will be able to flex this a bit and get it to you know like this you'll be able to make each side move so that's not too much of an issue but you need to get it pretty much right before you start so what I've done here I've got a, a rule Put it across the chassis and just looked at it like this and i can basically eye it up and see that it's pretty much bang on um until you actually get the wheels on and get it sat down you won't know but you know a little bit of slight tweaking will be possible but you won't be able to pull it around too much and i can see there that that glue joint in there needs some more on it that suspension arm needs to come up so this is the beauty again of the tamiya extra thin just take it on there just put a drop on I'll do the same on both sides just to make sure we've got a good joint because it needs to be fairly strong and there we go that's that done so now we need to start looking at our steering arms so we've, we've done up to eight so we've got nine ten and eleven so let's see if we can find those on here can't see them on that one on that one so there's nine so we'll cut that one off there's ten so we'll cut that one off and there's eleven so just take that off of there and take that off of 
there. There we go. So they're now cleaned up. Well, they need to be cleaned up, should I say. So there's one of those ejector pin stubs that I was talking about. So you need to just cut that off. And we've got one of those on here as well. So I'm going to cut that one off. And then using our sponge sanding stick, I'm just going to remove the sprue nib and the seam line. As I say, you don't need to worry about the seam line. And on most modern kits, the seam line won't be anything like as big as it is on this one. Modern kits, especially the likes of Tamiya and a lot of the main kits, they tend to be uh, very good, very high quality. And you will hear the term, if you're new to the hobby, you will hear the term shake and bake. And what that terminology means is it meant like many of Tamiya kits, you could basically chuck a, pot, chuck a pot of glue in the box, put the lid back on, give it a good shake, take it out and it's done. They go together that easy. Um, for that reason, I tend to find them a little sometimes boring. Uh, there is no challenge to them for the experienced modeler, but you do end up with a beautiful replica of whatever it is you're building. So you pay your money, you take your choice. Some people actually enjoy doing these older kits like this one. Um, because they see them as more of a challenge and you know these older kits that are like you know sort of 10 or 15 pounds if, if this was a modern if this modern car in 35th scale was done by someone like Bronco it would probably be about 28 32 pounds something like that so um yeah so these older kits for the financially are a great a great investment <laughs> not investment but they're cheaper than the modern kits, certainly. So we've got our three parts there. So we can see that we've got the number nine is our steering arm going into the floor. Ten and eleven go on to the actual um, hubs themselves. So we can start by putting number nine into the floor. And we can see here that we've got three holes. One, two, three. They've cut away the chassis rail there. You can see so you can see it. So you've got one, two, three holes. And it's going into the forward hole so you can see we've got the forward hole there so this has got to glue into there so i'll use this one for you again guys so i'm just going to put a drop on there and as we can see yeah that's blocked up in the time i've been doing this that nozzle's blocked up so as i say it's a pain to use that one so I can use this in the way you can put a drop on there with the brush and then assemble or you can assemble first. So that's just going to go in that hole like that. I'm not going to worry about positioning it accurately because these steering arms will set that for me. So we can see that number 10 is the shorter one. So if I just put a drop of glue in the hole there. I should then be able to just sit that on there like so. There we go, that's sat there. And then what I can do is just put a drop of glue in that hole there where it's going. And then with my tweezers, just put it in the hole there like that. The other beauty of the Tamiya Extra Thin is it dries very quickly. The quick setting stuff dries instantaneously pretty much. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to put a drop of glue in that hole there and a drop of glue on there. And then grab this part with my tweezers. And then isn't easy on camera guys now by now that glue has probably dried out so it probably won't stick but there we go it's okay and then I can just put this end 
on there. I don't know if you can hear it. I'm sorry, but my stomach is rumbling like crazy. It's um, it's currently about seven in the morning. And I haven't had breakfast yet, so that's probably why. So then I could just dab a, put a dab of glue on there afterwards, give it another little nudge. Oops, I pulled that one apart. As I say, this is probably not a good kit for beginners. But then the good thing is when you've got something like this that, you know, you will see as a bit of a challenge, it's a lot more satisfying. Um, like I say, you get some of those shake and bake kits, you put those together and, you know, cut the hours and you want another one. Um, something like this, it'll take you quite a while to get together and at the end of it, you'll find old people like me will say, wow, you've made a nice job of that because we know how difficult this old stuff can be to get together. So I'm just going to check they're all level still. Yep, we're all level. So there we go, that's the steering arms on. Uh, so that's now we've gone up to part number 11. So now we want 12 and 13. So I'll get 12 and 13 off the sprues, give them a clean up, and then I'll show you putting the rear axle and then we'll call that a day. So these parts are cleaned up now. So we've got 13, 12, and 14. And if you notice, I've got the leaf springs, one's here and one's up there. This is just the way I work. <clears throat> these springs appear to be identical, so I don't think it would matter if you got them swapped over. But when I cut them off the sprues, I need to know which is which. So we always put the lower number here and the higher number there. So I've got 12 here, 13 there. That's just the way I work. You may choose to do that. You may choose to take one off at a time. But I need to glue both of these to the axle and then glue the axle in place. So I need both of them off. So we've got our axle here. And we can look on the instructions there. We can see it goes this way round with the holes facing up. On the back side, there are no holes. So... There we go. Now, I've had to do a lot of cleanup on this because there was quite a seam. And you can see that I've still got some seam in there to remove. And it's easier to do it now than when it's all together. And again, you can see here, this is the beauty of having the, the modelling knife with the little slender blade. Either this type or the X-Acto type. Because you can get in there, which you wouldn't be able to touch your blade. So... I know number 12 goes on this side towards me, so I put some cement in that hole. And I'm looking on here and I can see, in fact, no, I can't see, but basically I know that looking at this, that the longer hole, the longer peg goes at the back. You can see here that the actual leaf spring itself, when it goes in, it's flush on the front and it sits proud at the back like that okay so they haven't shown you that again this is another problem with these older kits they haven't shown you anything in the instructions that shows you which way around that spring goes but I know it goes that way so we glue that in there like that then we put another double glue in here now you do need to make sure guys you get a good strong joint here because this is a this axle it sits like that one on the springs. So when the vehicle's turned over, the weight of the vehicle is pulling away on that glue joint. So make sure you get a good strong joint there. Make sure the springs are straight, like that. <clears throat> I'm just gonna give that a few seconds for the glue to bite. And then we can offer the part up, or the assembly up, should I say. See, that's not, that's not dried there yet. Like I say, you need to make sure you've got a good strong joint. I'll turn the camera off now and I'll come back in a second once this is dried. Right, that's had a, a couple of minutes now to start to go off. So all I've got to do now is pick the axle up with the springs and then gently place, place the assembly in there. Make sure all four pegs are in all four holes, like so. And then just take my Tamiya Extra Thin, 
and just put a drop on there a drop on there a drop on there and a drop on there and then with my tweezers I'm just going to push down and make sure everything has gone together properly but I mustn't push down on the axle because as I said earlier I'll pull that glue joint away if I do so there we go that's that all done now I don't know if it's not possible on this model but quite often when you build trucks and stuff you can look along look down the axle line and check everything's in line but on this kit the wheel arch is getting in the way so you can't really tell until you get it built up um, but as I say there will be some tweakability there's a new word for you there'll be some tweakability in the front so we can make sure that once it's all gone together we get all four wheels touching the ground the other question you might be asking is why am I why aren't I painting anything you've got two options with uh, the way you work painting has its benefits beforehand and painting has its benefits after I'll give you both sides of the coin if you want to paint this steering wheel, for example, it's easy to paint it on the sprue because it's held there. Yeah? Two problems with that. Once you cut it off, you've then got the... When you sand the, the nibs away, you're going to be sanding away the paint. So you have to paint it after you've done it anyway. So it'll be easier to remove it, stick it onto a cocktail stick or something, and then paint it once it's cleaned up, and then fit it. The problem then is, when you fit it, when you glue it, you're going to damage the paint and the paint will impair the joint so a painted part won't stick as well as a non-painted part some of if it's a thin coat of acrylic with with glues like this that are termed as being hot i.e when they say hot they mean they're they're quite aggressive they will attack the plastic quite a lot um it won't affect it a lot but when you get stuff like this where you've got these suspension joints that need to be very strong then it's best not to put anything in there that's going to compromise the joint so in that example what I'm going to do here is do this and then paint the whole thing paint it all green and then pick out all the details with a brush and paint it afterwards if I painted it before I would now have to go around and touch up all where I've put the glue this here would have been fairly weak and it would have all got damaged so it would have to be all repainted anyway so it's best as far as you can paint as much as you can before you actually start getting the um sorry build as much as you can before you start getting the paint out if you really want a kit that you can just build and not have to worry about painting until the very end get yourself a tank um, if you build pretty much any model tank you can do the whole thing and then paint it afterwards so right what are we going to do now to finish step one we need the gearbox and the engine so neither are on there Neither are on there. Neither are on there. There's our engine. We can see here part number 15. So we can cut that one off the sprue. And then going here, there's our gearbox. So we can cut that one off the sprue. Again, we'll give it a good clean up. So we'll take the nib off. And then again, using this hard sanding stick. The other thing is with these sanding sticks, don't ever throw them away. Because when they, as they get worn out, like this one here is pretty much worn out. It becomes finer so you end up with a finer sanding stick so you don't leave any scratch marks behind like so and you can see that because that's square and it's hard and it's flat all I've done is remove the nib and not done anything any other damage to the part at all so I'll do the same on the front of the gearbox here and that's it just a quick clean up on the back so they're ready to go in so You can see the engine goes in with the sump part facing rearwards so that's going to go on like that so we can test fit that in there and that fits in there. in fact that fits so well it just clips into place 
And that's the other thing, guys, with using this glue. Remember I said you have to dry fit stuff first. Well, with that glue, you can dry fit it because you can dry fit it and then add the glue afterwards. And now we're going to drop the gearbox in. That's just going to sit in there like so. So now we'll take our Tamiya Extra Thin. Put a dab there. Dab on the other side. And what's called capillary action, you may not have ever heard the term, but the capillary action will take the glue along the joint. In fact, what I'll do now, I'll get some old parts and I'll show you what capillary action does. And it's another benefit of this glue. Wait there a second. Right, I've got a couple of bomb halves here. These are off an old Revell kit, I think. Um, so I've cleaned them up and I'm just going to put them together like this. Now, if I was using this glue, I would have to basically go around the edge, go around the edge here and put the glue on all the way around and then stick the parts together. But this is the beauty with this stuff. You can put these parts together like so. Yeah, and just hold them. Now, don't be tempted to put any tape or anything on there because this term I'm using called capillary action, basically what it does, it pulls the glue along a joint. The glue will follow, because it's so thin, the glue will follow a gap. Now, as I hold these parts like this, you can see they, they gently come apart, right? So I'm going to try and show you now. I'm going to use too much glue and try and show you what this capillary action means. Now, see the joint there? You can see the joint there, I hope. And what I'm going to do is get a lot of glue on the brush and I'm just going to basically touch the joint with the brush. And you can see that they're in that gap. There is glue. See the glue sat in there? Watch what happens when I squeeze it together. You see the glue goes along the joint. So that glue has now gone all the way from there to there. All right. So what I can do is just add some more glue and you might see it go along. Can add some more glue. And there's something I'll show you now you'll like. If you're new to this. I'm using too much glue to get the uh, to give you the effect. If I squeeze this now, you will see that all the way along there I get plastic oozing out, malted plastic oozing out of the joint. And that will then act as like a filler for me. So that there now, I can leave that to go off. You can see it's almost dry already. I can leave that to go off and when I sand it, I don't need to fill it because the plastic is oozing out. So I'll show you again on this side. Okay, if you watch, I'll put the glue on and you should see it run along the joint. There you go. So I can just go along here with this liquid cement, put it on. Now obviously it won't go into a gap like that at the back, so I need to hold that together. And then a beauty here, I've got the open joint, I can put it inside. So it saves me, removes the risk of me doing any damage to any detail. And then hold that together. And that's it. And that's that glue, that's that bomb glued together and I can squeeze those joints make the glue ooze out just like that you see there hope you can catch it in the light and that's that that's what they call capillary action so there we go right so we finished step one of the uh, of Monty's Humber so we'll leave it there and then when I come back we'll start on step two um, if you'd like to see me do every single step of this build all the way through, I'm more than happy to do so. If you're finding it too long-winded and boring, just tell me and I'll cut it down, I'll shorten it. Um, this is my first really proper beginner's video, so I don't know where to sort of set my level. So um, please add in the comments below what you think, what you'd like to see. And if you want to see me do something else or something simpler, then um, simpler, is that a word? Something more simple.
then just uh, just just let me know in the comments below. Um, I, I want to get more people into the hobby and basically show the younger guys or the newer guys out there that it's nothing to be scared of. It's um it's really enjoyable and it can be a, a very very satisfying hobby. All right, so thanks for watching, and um, I'll see you for part three, which will be up very soon. Um, tomorrow is Christmas Day, two thousand eighteen, and if you want to come back and have a look on the uh, on the channel, I'll be doing a an all day online build of that um, E one hundred tank I showed you earlier. So um, <clears throat> yeah, come back and have a look for that. All right, so uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you all soon, and happy Christmas.